Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. So if you go and speak with people regarding cryptocurrencies, many of these skeptics outline a lot of fundamental issues with cryptocurrencies. For example, many people say that something like Bitcoin has the potential of replacing the existing form of fiat money and therefore governments are never going to approve something like Bitcoin. Some people say that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are not producing anything of fundamental value. For example, I don't see anything being manufactured. So how is it that Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies have value? They might also say that cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, they promote illicit activities. So the point is that people debate for and against cryptocurrencies all the time and a lot of this debate stems from not knowing the basics of cryptocurrencies. Therefore, on today's video, we are going to understand what exactly is Bitcoin, what is the fundamental value of Bitcoin and some frequently asked questions regarding Bitcoin. I will try to help you understand about Bitcoin in a very easy to understand language. So let us start with absolute basics. What exactly is Bitcoin? The easiest way to understand Bitcoin is to consider it as a digital asset. Digital simply means that it is on computer. It's a software code. It is based on a certain technology called as blockchain technology. That's digital part. And asset means that something which is of value. Now, different countries have categorized Bitcoin differently. For example, some countries like El Salvador have categorized Bitcoin as a legal tender. So it is a legal currency there. On the other hand, countries like India have not yet defined the status of Bitcoin. They might just consider it to be an asset and give it a broad definition. If you check Bitcoin's website, this is what Bitcoin says and it has defined it as Bitcoin uses peer-to-peer -peer technology to operate with no central authority of banks. This is called as decentralization. Managing transactions and the issues of Bitcoin is carried out collectively by the network. This network is based on a technology called as the blockchain technology. Bitcoin is open source. Its design is public. Nobody owns or controls Bitcoin and everyone can take part. So this exhibits features of decentralization. Through many of its unique properties, Bitcoins allows exciting uses that could not be covered by any previous payment system. Now, this is a highly complicated paragraph that I just outlined in front of you. So let me break it down by identifying a few keywords. So the first keyword that we need to understand regarding Bitcoin is the blockchain network. Now, we use network on everyday basis. A classic example will be internet. So internet is a network on which a range of applications are built and there are different usages of internet. For example, you can go access websites. You can make payments via internet. You can go and watch videos via internet. So the network is internet and it adds a lot of functionality on that network. So internet is a network on which an organization called as ICANN exerts a lot of influence. ICANN is a non-profit organization that plays a critical role in terms of the development and expansion of the internet. On the flip side, Bitcoin is also a network. It is based on a technology called as the blockchain technology and Bitcoin is a decentralized network. Now, what is the meaning of decentralization? Decentralization in very easy to understand language means it does not have an ICANN type of an organization that manages that network. A parallel example would be the banking system. For example, when you go and deposit your money in JP Morgan Chase, the organization is highly centralized because JP Morgan formulates a lot of policies, whom they would take on as client, how the transaction process will work, and a bunch of other systems and processes at play. But Bitcoin, on the other hand, is a decentralized network. There is no one who is exerting control over Bitcoin. So the obvious question here would come that if no one is controlling Bitcoin, then how is it running? So that's the magic of blockchain network, that the blockchain network, the technology has been designed in such a manner that it can be self-sustaining. It is highly secure, self-sustaining. People have incentive not to cheat the network. We will understand all these concepts in the advanced part of this video. But for the time being, you need to remember is that blockchain network has given Bitcoin a functionality that a network can be designed, which can facilitate payments, which can facilitate transactions and it adds a lot of value to a network which is highly decentralized. A decentralized network in very simple way means that there is no central authority that exerts influence over it and everyone has equal influence on this decentralized network. Now comes the final concept which is very interesting is the concept of distributed ledger. 
Now, a very easy way to imagine and understand what distributed ledgers are, you need to understand how the banking system currently operates. For example, currently, if you go and transfer your money from HDFC Bank to JP Morgan Chase account, what generally happens is that these centralized ledgers, these are not distributed ledgers, these are centralized ledgers. For example, HDFC Bank will control this ledger. This second ledger where I'm transferring my money might be controlled by the second bank, maybe JP Morgan Chase. Now I go and instruct my bank that pay $100 from me to my friend who has an account in JP Morgan. So $100 will be debited here and then $100 will be credited here to my friend. So this is how centralized ledgers operate that every bank will have their own account books where the debit and credit entries will keep on happening. On the flip side, you have something called as distributed ledger. Now imagine distributed ledger to be a very big book. Everyone can see it. It is available publicly. All the entries of credit and debit that are happening on this ledger are easily visible to everyone. Furthermore, you can't destruct this ledger because everyone who has a computer node or a computer terminal is easily able to create a copy of this ledger. And if I'm making any change to this ledger, again, that copy will automatically make a change here. So this is a simplified viewpoint what a distributed ledger is and Bitcoin incorporates these different features. Yes, it is a little bit complicated, no doubt about that. But this blockchain and distributed ledger technology has allowed Bitcoin to operate in a very smooth and transparent manner. Now, depending on how you are categorizing Bitcoin, it has a range of functionalities and a range of fundamental values. This is where the confusion starts when people start questioning that, hey, when I'm buying a stock, there is some underlying value in it. For example, example, when I'm buying a stock of Ford Motor, Ford actually produces a car. What is Bitcoin technically producing? So a better example to compare this will be fintech companies. When you go and purchase a stock of any fintech company, what is it that the fintech company is producing? The answer is it is not producing anything, but it is adding a utility. A utility simply means that, for example, PayPal, it allows you to transfer money from point A to point B. That's a utility. It is not generating something. It is not producing widgets or t-shirts or mobile phones. So that is the utility play. And many of the assets that are technology based, technically do not produce anything, they add value. So let us quickly try to understand this value add feature and this value argument of Bitcoin. So if we compare Bitcoin to something like a traditional cash, then what is happening right now is that, for example, just in November, December last year, the rate of inflation in the US was roughly seven and a half percent. So let's imagine a scenario where the rate of inflation is seven and a half percent. The money that you have kept in your bank account from $100, it comes to $92.5. That is called as erosion of wealth and currencies, the traditional fiat money, be it US dollar, Singapore dollar, INR, they are a very bad store of value. If you ask the second category of question here that why is it that fiat money is a bad store of value? The answer there is fairly obvious. The answer is that the governments get infinite power to print any amount of money that they want. If you take a look at the quantitative easing that has happened post-2008, there have been several rounds of quantitative easing and a large part of the money that exists today has been printed in the last one and a half decades. So every time the printer turns on and more and more fiat money is printed, the value of the US dollar or INR or Singapore dollar that you hold, it keeps on going down. Bitcoin, on the other hand, the way it is designed is that the supply of Bitcoin is limited and there are only 21 million Bitcoins that can be released onto the Bitcoin blockchain network. Now, you might ask me that, okay, why is it that only 21 million Bitcoin and who guarantees only 21 million Bitcoin? The answer there lies in the concept of smart contracts on which I will make a separate video. But smart contracts are programmable codes that have been generated and they are immutable. That is that they cannot be changed. Once it has been decided that Bitcoin network is only going to have 21 million Bitcoin and here is a schedule as per which it will be released onto the network, that limit of 21 million Bitcoin cannot be violated. So as a result, Bitcoin technically becomes an asset which has a finite supply very similar to gold. Therefore, sometimes Bitcoin is also called as digital gold and many a times it is compared to gold also. Just to complete this thought process because of its limited supply, Bitcoin becomes very valuable and it is not inflationary in nature like common fiat currency and therefore it acts as a very good store of value. Now you would say, okay, great, that's just one feature. Can you talk about more features? What adds further fundamental value to Bitcoin? 
So this brings us to a comparison with gold. Now, if you consider fiat currencies, they are great at medium of exchange. If you go to Starbucks or if you want to purchase a bike, you can go pay US dollar or INR, get that bike or get that coffee. It's a great medium of exchange, but fiat money is a very bad store of value. On the flip side, gold is a decent store of value because the value of gold does not usually fall simply because of the fact that gold too also has a finite supply. But gold is a very bad medium of exchange. Think about it this way that if you have to buy coffee at Starbucks by using gold, you are not going to go and shave off gold and pay 10 grams of gold there. You can't do it. So therefore, it's a very bad medium of exchange. Bitcoin solves both of these problems. It has other fundamental features also, which I'm linking here. You can go zoom in and develop a better perspective about it. But if we understand Bitcoin more thoroughly, it's very obvious that Bitcoin solves a lot of issues that exist in the current form of fiat currency, plus in commodities like gold. On top of that, Bitcoin is transparent because it is based on distributed ledger technology. It is safe because of the encryption code that is used and the level of technology that has gone into developing it. It is decentralized. So there are a bunch of other value added features too. Many people ask that can you really buy anything with Bitcoin? Yes, there are more than 15,000 businesses that accept Bitcoin and many of them are listed companies. So this brings us to the final section of the video where I will answer three key questions regarding Bitcoin. One is if Bitcoins grow in popularity, then won't the governments lose control over printing their own money? And why would a sovereign allow this to happen? So to be honest, number one, Bitcoin is not designed to replace fiat money. It has certain attributes that are coming out to be better than fiat money. But it does not mean that Bitcoin is going to replace money. There will always be users both of Bitcoin and fiat money. They will see value in certain features that the sovereign currency offers and Bitcoin offers and they can take positions in both these assets. The world is big enough for all these different things to coexist. The second key argument is that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, they can promote the use of illicit activities in the financial system. So what do you have to say about it? It might or might not be the case, but again, it's the same atomic energy argument. For example, people can create atomic bombs also by using the same technology, you can create fission and fusion reactors that can lead to generation of electricity. So it's a technology which can lead to good purposes and bad purposes. And the world needs to come together and build systems to curb illicit or bad activities. The third argument that is usually presented is that Bitcoin is extremely volatile. Its prices keeps on going up and down, up and down. So how can it be an asset? What we need to understand is that cryptocurrencies are fairly young. They are still evolving and it will take time for them to mature. That's how any asset class is developed. If you consider the journey of even stock investing in emerging countries like India, when stock market started out, the liquidity was low, volatility was very high, but over time, the stock markets also matured. Same scenario is going to play out in any asset class, including Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So in summary, Bitcoin is definitely very complex, but I hope that this small video allowed you to understand the basics of Bitcoin. If there is enough interest, I will make an advanced part of Bitcoin. Please like and subscribe to the channel and I will see you the next time.